just run through a bit of a presentation. Um, and then if everyone sort of keeps their microphones muted for now, this is more of a like a meeting, um, so a chat, you know, I want it to be sort of interactive and people to ask questions as we go. Um, I'll just go through a bit of a presentation on stuff that I've sort of learned over the years. Um, and then, you know, if you have any questions as we go, just sort of chip in and we will try and answer them as we go. Um, it's um, pretty relaxed. It's more, it was more sort of a follow up to Nicole Masters and Graham Hand. And um, just to sort of, um, you know, go over a few of the principles and just sort of troubleshoot any ideas people had and any issues and things like that. So um, I will kick off now that it's sort of 5.30. And yeah, just, just, just we'll keep it pretty relaxed. So this is me standing in a field of grass at Mangarara Station. Um, so uh, Mangarara is, you know, they're really, really into their region ag and Greg has sort of been into it for a long time, uh, maybe for about 15, 20 years. And he sort of follows the principles of the Savory Institute, very much into his holistic <coughs> management principles. And then he sort of read uh, Mark Shepard's Restoration Agriculture. And this is sort of a, an example of that sort of permaculture principles coming into the farm. So here we've got rows of uh, fruit trees. Um, I don't know, can you see my mouse? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So these are fruit trees, basically. Um, apple trees, pear trees. And there's also some nitrogen fixing trees in, in sort of every third or fourth tree. And the idea is to sort of create these avenues that we can graze. Um, we were grazing these with, we had a small uh, dairy herd that we graze. And so we're just sort of playing around with these ideas. Greg's very much into tree planting. And it, it's quite different in New Zealand because you don't really have the sort of the hedgerows and the tree plantings and woodlands you, that you do over here in the UK. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it, it's just a really quite a fun example of what, what we were trying to achieve over there. So I'll try and, okay, slide two. Okay, so, you know, most of you guys will know um, these principles. Um, you know, what is regenerative agriculture? Well, so I pulled this off um, a really good website called the Regenerative Agriculture Defined, definition, sorry, Terrigenesis, I think, put this together. And they, so they sort of define it and I kind of, I quite like this definition. It's, you know, it's a system of farming principles and practices that increases biodiversity, it enriches soils, it improves watersheds and enhances ecosystem services. And that's quite an interesting one, that ecosystem services. Um, I know Nicole touched on that. It's not, although they do say it aims to ca capture carbon in soil, um, and reversing this global trends of, you know, and basically the climate crisis that we're facing at the moment. But this thing about this enhancing ecosystem services is, is quite interesting, um, particularly now with the new uh, environmental land management scheme coming into play. And there's going to be a lot of, well, there's a lot of work around at the moment, uh, pilot farms and things that are looking at these ecosystem services. And to me, that sort of, you know, that public, public uh, money for public goods um, kind of falls under this sort of category, which is really quite cool if you're into this sort of thing. Um, it, you know, it can increase biodiversity, it definitely enriches the soils and, you know, as your infiltration rates and things like that, um, and your soil health improves, you know, it's going to improve your, your watersheds as well, which is another thing for the UK coming from New Zealand, water runoff is not necessarily such a big issue, especially um, where I'm from, but it is definitely an issue here in the UK, um, especially after we have such a wet winter and then we've had such a dry spring um, and everyone kind of freaking out that we're heading into a drought. Um, so as I said, you know, it aims to capture carbon. Um, this can, you know, this is a little bit sort of, a bit of a sticky area at the moment because um, sorry, it's ringing. Um, you know it's gonna 
Carmen is quite a tricky thing. It's uh, until we can standardize that, it's, it's going to be quite difficult to prove this. Um, just because your soils are high in carbon doesn't necessarily mean that um, that carbon is functioning. So it's, so you, there's, it's some intricacies to that as well. Um, it offers resilience, which is definitely something why, uh, you know, it's it stemmed from sort of Australia and America. Um, because it's creating resilience for their systems. And, you know, Australia is a real um, dramatic climate, basically. You get these such extremes that we haven't really had here in the UK. They're starting to sneak in a little bit. Um, but that's kind of, you know, where, where the world's going, unfortunately. And as Darren Doherty says, you know, we're Australifying the world. Um, so this sort of system... It's definitely about uh, putting resilience into your into your farming system, um, and then you know it it does. There's there's this thing around you know trying to prove that does it work. You know, where's the scientific evidence to back this up? And it is such a new um, way of thinking. You know, a lot of this information has only be, really become available in the last sort of five to ten years, but there's a lot of information out there from um, sort of uh, organic farming, um, agroecology, biodynamics, agroforestry, <laughs> and then obviously like the savory hubs and things like that, um, Alan Savory Holistic Management and things like that. Oh, oh, here we go. Um, so this, this is kind of like the five principles and, and you guys probably all know this, um, but I'll just go over them briefly. You know, minimum soil disturbance. And this is why ploughing is kind of not really encouraged in the original system. Um, that min till, no till, direct drilling sort of styles. In Australia, there's um, a really clever guy, Colin Sides, who's doing pasture cropping, where he will work with, um, kind of work with the grassland and plant during its dormancy and plant like wheat and crops, arable crops straight into permanent pastures and doing um, really amazing things with that. Um, keeping the soil covered, um, that feeding the soil, keeping that armor there, just to, you know, there's so many um, reasons to do this, but just kind of, you're feeding the soil from above, but you're also just keeping it covered so that you're not losing all that carbon and all that moisture and, and all your nutrients as well. And, you know, obviously, Niels, uh, you can delve a lot deeper into this in your, um, in your webinars as well. Um, maintaining a living root, feed the soil, keep that photosynthesis pumping. You know, it's all about the photosynthesis, maintaining the green, because it's a photosynthesis that feeds the soil biology. Um, and that's, you know, that's where sort of... Um, it's quite exciting over here in the UK because that potential for growing green grass is phenomenal. Um, so uh, hopefully you all kind of understand the whole concept of that photosynthesis, um, pumping exudates into the soil, um, and then in return, the, micro, uh, the microbiology in the soil uh, releasing minerals and making them available to the plant. And that's you know, essentially that sort of cycle of, um, between the plant and the soil and when the uh, mycorrhizal fungi comes into play then it uh, creates that networking that enhances that. Um, diversity, you know, you want it to be as diverse as possible. There's so many reasons for this but it's, it's about building resilience, it's about diversity in your sort of in your root architecture, it's about diversity for your animal health, diversity for plant health and uh, the plants themselves actually work together as a community. And so I think, you know, some people sort of advocate a nine plus sort of um, mix in terms of creating diversity. Um, I'm, I hope, well, the farm that I'm taking on down here in Cornwall, I'm going to be putting in a 30 way mix. Um, I know some people will put in, you know, Nicole Masters talks about putting in a 50 way mix. But it's sort of, once you get above eight, I think you're starting to get that interrelationship between the plant community. And that's also, you know, under sowing, companion planting, field margins, field strips, cover crops. 
and obviously you know the ultimate diversity is a really 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 complex permanent pasture and this sort of comes back to that you know why we're here is talking about uh, grazing management and i know a few people out there will will say that um this style of farming uh, depletes diversity but actually it can be quite the opposite and it's all about the management of it um, and also obviously why we're all here pasture for life you know incorporate livestock there's 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 a very intricate relationship between ruminants grassland and soil like ruminants have such a complex microbiology and so does the soil and there's even you know studies that show that by grazing your grassland you encourage growth even just and that's what i do in the spring to get things to take off when it's all just sitting there i'll do a whole farm rotation just to get that to kick start the um, spring grass really and, and there's you know there's things in the saliva that stimulate tillering in the grasslands there's um, i think potassium salts in the saliva and it, it's because that the ruminant animal has evolved over time with grassland and built soil over time. And this is where this whole sort of um, savory uh, model and Joel Salatin talk about, you know, the buffalo roaming across America and building those soils that we now exploit for our food crops. And it, you know, it's the quickest way to build soil is to incorporate livestock. And I think it's right. Okay. So, I don't really prescribe to any one school of thought. I sort of take, you know, I draw information from certain areas. Um, so, you know, adaptive, regenerative, holistic, managed grazing, call it what you will, I don't really mind. Um, but to me, the, the concept of this whole system approach, so basically what you do in one part of your your land or your enterprise or your farm or your community everything affects something else so if you look at your farm as a whole system so you understand you know where certain nutrient movements are so you can play around with so say you've got you know a rough field that's struggling for nutrients and you've really got a quite a high nutrient density field you can play around with your grazing to move those nutrients from one field to another just by the timing of it so say if you went and grazed like a, a one of your herbal lays or something like that in the morning and then rested the animals in the evening on some really rough pasture that you know that's struggling things like that and and also you'll see on slopes i was at a farm the other day and it was very very obvious that basically all this topsoil has come down the slope and you can you can then transfer that back up the hill with the movement of the animals. So there's lots of fun things you can do if you understand everything is interconnected. And also you've got to, um, you know, you've got to remain dynamic. There's no prescribed method. I know there's this sort of third, third, third grazing, there's the tall grass grazing, there's long rotation, all these things, but you've just, you've basically got to remain dynamic so that you can, you know, you, you just, uh, if, if you really understand your land, then that's that's the key for me. I think um, it varies. It varies with the weather. It varies with the season. It, it can vary with your objectives of your farm. So what you want to achieve for your farm. You know, you might want to bank feed for the winter. Um, you might want to increase fungal dominance. Um, you might want to encourage growth. You might want to um, grow your animals out you know you've got to be adaptive and you've got to understand that it's it's not a prescribed method it's just you once you understand it then you can play around with it um so for me you know there's there's a publication somewhere about the levels of regenerative ag agriculture and a lot of the time we're sort of at this sort of um functional level you know this sort of the uh, no-till and all that sort of jazz but actually the the highest level is is sort of finding that true understanding of your land so find the niche of your farm what does the land do well naturally and it's getting that ultimate understanding of your land and i don't know what your land does you know so i can't offer you advice only you know your land 
and and the better that understanding then the more successful um that farming enterprise is going to be um so um you know it's all about and when you're talking about finding that niche it's also about understanding your own niche and working to your own strengths and the strengths of the business so when you look at the knowledge of that's there there might be knowledge in your family there might be knowledge passed down there might be knowledge in your staff that you're not aware of it's also about your staffing who's actually on the farm what are their strengths what can they do well and then look at the current infrastructure you know there's no point in having to invest in a load of money to make your farm function if it's going to you know if it's going to set you back so you look at your farm and you go, okay, well, what does this farm do well naturally? And then that's where you go for it. And the markets as well, you know, if it's, if it's an easy market, then, then go for it. Um, so these are, these are things that I kind of learned from um, Ian Mitchell when he came over to New Zealand. And I think, you know, he, he's a pretty clever guy and he really, his ideas really gelled with me. Um, and I sort of, the way I sort of talk about it is, mindful farming you know be mindful of your everyday actions and and i think that sort of for me definitely sums it up um and and also you know it's about enhancing ecosystem function and that is one of the reasons why i returned back to cornwall because in new zealand the the true regeneration of new zealand would be native bush there's no, there's no real grassland in New Zealand. It's all introduced. All our grass species in New Zealand came from the UK. Um, the whole landscape in New Zealand was created um, when it was colonised. Sheep and beef obviously didn't have, you know, there are no ruminants in New Zealand. So by coming back to the UK where it is a ruminant grassland sort of ecosystem, you can really, really play around with these this ecosystem function and really really get it humming um, and that's where your sort of your permanent pastures and things and working with the native grasses come in into play and you know work as close to nature as possible so if you can maximize your permanent pasture performance without having to go out and and sort of turn ground over buy cover crops do all this and understanding that sort of that inherent cost and also the inherent energy that's in that, you know, and, and I think this, if we can understand our permanent pasture and, and like people like Joel Salatin, he says, you know, he's never sown a seed in his life. Everything that he's done has happened naturally. And it's just about the management of that. And I think, you know, the UK has, has such a special uh, climate for grassland that it should just be absolutely charging. Um, incorporate your hedgerows your trees you know let your animals into the woodland and see what happens let them graze those the hedgerows because essentially you know that's they were they were browsers and grazers you know it's only because we've managed them into a grazing situation um, and then look at your objectives you know what do you want to achieve uh, during your grazing period because it changes throughout the year certain things like I touched on before, certain things will change throughout the year. So you can play around with your grazing. You know, you might want to encourage growth. You might want to um, improve your fungal networking. You might want to build covers. You might want to stockpile feed. You might want to clear feed out for, for fresh, fresh growth in the spring. But you, you, you want to look at your objectives. What do you want to achieve? And then go from there. So, you know, this type of style of pasture management, it can build soil carbon levels. It can build microbial function. You know, it, it can enhance water infiltration. It can. Oh. Hello. I think, have we got a question? Um, you know, so it, it does, it builds soil fertility. You, you do get nutrient dense food out of it and it does do all these things. Um, and so this is why it's so exciting to be involved in this. And it has, you know, such a huge potential because 
you know, as, as your system improves and as the health of your system improves, it, it becomes quite a fun, fun farming system to be a part of. Um, so, talking about Ian Mitchell-Innes, these are a few of his points that he made when he was over. All wealth comes from the sun. Your land is a solar panel. You know, your grasses that grow dictate the efficiency of that solar panel. So that energy is the elusive part of the equation. You know, there's so much protein out there, but there's not a lot of energy. And people who are focused on protein, you know, I, I've done, I've grown out um, dairy grazer heifers on a, a daily uh, live weight gain contract. And I'd let them into this beautiful lush pasture thinking, you know, they're gonna grow like stink. And actually the problem was, it was too rich. It was far too much protein and it just goes straight through them. And so when I started introducing sort of that more sort of slightly lignified uh, material into the system, that's when you could start to see that performance come through. And you can see it in the animals, you know, they, when they're bouncing and springy and happy and charging about, you know, they've got that energy level. You can see it in their coats, you can see it in their eyes. And I think, you know, that is something that we, over the years, we've just been chasing this protein thing. And, and especially for sheep and beef, you know, protein is, can be quite a problem. You know, it can cause lameness and a lot of health issues. Um, whereas if you've got a nice uh, energy rich sort of feed from your grassland, that's when you start to see animal performance. And I've seen it myself, you know, I've seen animals when I've sort of tweaked my grazing a bit we're getting growth rates of sort of over two kilos a day and it's you know the animals are fat as stink and and it's it's quite a pleasure to see the closer you work with nature the higher the chances are of succeeding because you're working with a natural system whereas the further away you get from that nature the harder you have to work because you, you're basically fighting against nature and that's another thing around this whole region of um, pasture management is about understanding the natural processes of that grass and how it performs in a natural environment or how it used to perform in a natural environment. Eat the plants in a vegetative state. So obviously this can vary a bit with, with, your, uh, with your objectives, but what you're trying to achieve is you're trying to keep that grass as green for as long as possible because that is going to create the photosynthesis that is going to feed the soil microbiology. And I think this is very key. And it's, it, it's achievable to grow your um, biomass without the plant setting seed. And the longer that it's green, the more photosynthesis it will be doing. And the more energy it will be putting into your soils, the more carbon it will be sequestering into your soils, and the healthier your soils will be. And so if we, we go back to that understanding that land is a solar panel. This is why the whole rotational grazing idea is so important because the, the more sort of concentrated your animals can be and then the rest of your farm can operate as, as a bigger solar panel. Um, whereas if you've got all your animals dotted all over the place, it sort of um, makes it a bit more difficult. Uh, the diversity, as I touched on before, diversity of plants, it creates stability and resilience. So, you know, if you've got a dry season, the plants that do well in the dry will do well. If you've got a wet season, the plants that do well in a wet season will do well. And the more diversity, the more resilience you'll have. So you can have early season grasses, have late season grasses, you can have cool climate grasses, you can have hot climate grasses, and you just filling all these different niches so that everything has a function, everything has a role. And, that, and then also that diversity creates that, uh, the, the relationship between the plants and the soil and they become, they work together as one. As I touched on before, you want to be feeding the soil from above. So with your um, leaf and plant matter breaking down, so that's that sort of that third, third, third principle. So you're feeding, you are feeding your, your soil from above and that will feed that above ground sort of biology. 
and as that breaks down, you know, that's building that sort of that nice sort of carbon layer on top. But that is a decomposition one, and it, it, it is liable to sort of breaking down and losing that. If you want to really capture carbon into your soils, it's a photosynthesis. It's a liquid carbon pathway, um, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Functional carbon is more important than nitrogen. Nitrogen is free, you know, and there's so much nitrogen in the air. And I think we just concentrate too much on nitrogen. If we've got too much nitrogen in the system, then it's just, it just everything's running far too fast. Um, and, and it's, so if you, if you concentrate on building your carbon, everything else will come. Understanding the bacterial fungal ratio. So this sort of comes from uh, the workings of Elaine Ingham. And it's about the, the sort of the soil food web. So the theory is that you've got a very basic, um, highly simplistic system, which is a, a high nitrogen system. And it's very, very simplistic bacterial dominance. And that would be sort of your very intensive arable bare ground sort of thing. And then you, the, the far extreme to that is your sort of 100% fungal dominance is your, your forests, basically. Grassland is exactly in the middle. You know, it's sort of around that one to one ratio. It might tweak a little bit either way but if you can get that ratio around that sort of one to one in terms of bacteria fungi balance then that's where grassland is should be and you can play around with that you know if you want to increase your fungal dominance then you get more sort of lignified material into it if you want to increase your bacterial dominance then you add more sort of nitrogen stuff. It's, it's kind of like the same idea around composting. So in composting, you have a perfect ratio of nitrogen to carbon. Same with the grassland. And essentially that's what this is. You're creating a compost type situation in your soil using grass and animals as your tools. So, you know, a lot of this, um, you can see if you've got a lot of protein in the system, then it will generally be a bacterially dominated soil. Um, and as you introduce a more fungal balance into that, that's when you start to get that mycorrhizal functioning happening. And you can see it. I was on a farm the other day, and you could see, you can see the patches like the greening, and you'll see patches. And it, ha you know, it's quite exciting when you see it happen. Um, I've seen it happen on farms in New Zealand. You'll see the patches come together and you'll think, you know, oh, that's dung patches or urine patches and that's just a lot of nitrogen or whatever. But actually it's the fun, it's the fungi and then they link up and you'll see these green patches and then over time those patches will link up and then over a certain amount of time you'll see your whole field will become nice and green and lush. And uh, this is a fun one from uh, Mr. Oops. Mr. Mitchellinus, sorry, don't uh, stop sending money to town, basically. Stop sending money to town. Remove, you, you know, try not to rely so heavily on inputs. And I think, you know, this is definitely the case for a lot of farms in the UK, um, and especially in a grassland situation. You know, I've, I've worked on farms, I've worked on organic farms for a very, very long time. And, you know, we just don't put inputs. We just don't. We don't really add anything to the system because it's all there. And and with a um, you know sheep or beef enterprise, you're not actually taking a lot off. It's very different in an arable situation or a vegetable situation, but you can do the sums. You can work out how many minerals you're actually losing from the system. Um, so the liquid carbon pathway. I'm I'm sure most of you people are quite aware of this. Um, it was sort of coined by Christine Jones, who's a soil ecologist from Australia. And she's done a lot of studies around building soil. Um, so they'll, you know, run trials where they're planting plants directly into sand in Australia and seeing the, you know, seeing what happens. And I've worked out that 
that this this liquid carbon pathway so it's about the photosynthesis and the exudates coming through photosynthesis feeding the soil biology and this is an example of soil biology colonizing uh, roots basically um, and that's called uh, uh, what do they call it nails by well, rust the roots but um riso sheaths riso sheaths of course um and you know this is an example from fred price who's a bit of a legend around this so he's doing loads of work with his arable system and you'll see this a lot more uh in an arable situation with annuals um so you won't get that sort of dramatic looking root structure for a perennial system um, but it's, it's, it's interesting, I was, I was reading a paper today actually about um, annuals and perennials and the different sort of uh, root structures. And there's not a lot of difference between the root structures, but it's a colonization of those roots. It's a lot quicker with an annual. So this land that I'm taking on, <clears throat> uh, part of my mix, it's an annual perennial mix. The idea of putting the annuals into it is that it kickstarts that soil biology and boosts that biology. And then as those annuals die out over time, then you come into a more of a permanent system. Energy flows from above, the minerals flow from below. So it's a symbiotic relationship whereby you're feeding sugars into the soil. And this is a very simplistic view, but if you want to understand more, Go on one of Neil's is a great webinars. But basically the idea is that you're feeding the biology from above through the um, through the roots and through the exudates. And I think you know up to about 40% of carbon goes out as exudates for some plants to feed the soil. And it's about linking that, creating that link. You know, if this was a conventional farm and they've seen it before if they put nitrogen on or phosphate or things like that it breaks that link you know the plant's like well i don't really need i don't need to seek out um those nutrients because i'm getting fed from above through a water soluble source and um, whereas this here creates a really intricate relationship and that's when you think about the mycorrhizal fungi which sort of goes onto the root hairs and extends those root hairs so that it can seek out minerals and that mineral energy exchange and that's why it's really important to keep that photosynthesis going because it's the photosynthesis that creates those exudates and you can recognize this through things like bricks testing and things like that that will show you the rates you know will give you an indication of how well your plants are photosynthesizing and essentially how how well they're feeding the soil so we'll get into the grazing aspect and um you know this is this is just one angle i just want to present this information obviously i don't know everything i know a few things this has kind of come from my own personal experience and things that i've learned over this, a few years so people might have different ideas um so whether you want to take it away or not that's up to you but for me i think this is this has definitely helped me understand it a lot more so when you're thinking about grassland so if we have a look at this picture if you think so what i always try to avoid is eating below that red line because if you can keep above that red line then you maintain this root structure once you start to get below that red line this is when you start to lose that root structure because what the plant is doing is it's dropping the root structure in order to gain the energy to grow again. So if you're doing continuous grazing, you're just coming back to this, coming back to this, coming back to this. And you can see here from this really good example of what's happening to your roots, your root system. So if you can maintain this sort of amazing root density, or encourage or work back from this even which you know probably is the case for a lot of people then this is going to offer a great deal more resilience to the system and it's about minimizing the stress to the plant 
you know, stress, <clears throat> stress will send plants to seed. So when you go into a field and you see a set stocking situation that's had continuous grazing for years, um, you generally buy sheep and you can see it and you'll see that there's a really thin base to the plant. And then as soon as it gets stressed, like we've just had, especially in a ryegrass situation, everything will just go to seed and you'll just get no quality. It's just gone. All your, all your biomass is gone because the plant is stressed and it's trying to reproduce because that's just what it does naturally. So this is why we go for that sort of one bite principle. So, you know, you want your cows or your sheep to come in and just take the tops off the plant. And we'll, we'll get into it a little bit, uh, a little bit further on. But the energy is here. The energy is in the top of the plant, you know, and the animal will always seek energy first. So it starts off here and then it goes back. If it doesn't, if it isn't satisfied from that first couple of bites, then it will come back and it'll graze down a bit further. And then it'll graze a bit further. And then it'll graze a bit further. And as you go further down the base of that plant, the protein levels and that plant are getting higher, energy levels getting lower, the parasite um, sort of, well, there's a far more, <laughs> far more parasites, internal parasites, worms and things are at the base of the plant. They don't tend to come out up to the top. The animal will show you, it will, you look, you put your cows or your sheep into a field, they will walk around and they will eat the best bits of that field. You know, they, they will walk around, they'll walk the borders, so they'll, they'll go around the fences and they'll do one singular graze as a group. And they will tell you, where the energy is. And you, if you don't trust them, follow them around with a bricks meter and test the bricks of those plants that they're eating. And I've done it before and it's, it's very obvious that that's what, they're, that's what they're doing. So yeah, as I say, the further down the plant, the higher the protein content, and then you've got to achieve that balance between energy intake and protein intake. So you don't want the animals to be eating too much protein. The importance of mobbing up, rotational grazing. So if your animals have got constant access, so if they're set stocked, you know, they're, they're constantly there, they're grazing, they're going back, they're pulling out, they're eating their favorite bits. Over time, those plants will lose energy and they will essentially, and then they will get taken over by more competitive grasses. So that's where you get things like your less wildlife habitat, more exposed soil, your reduced diversity, more parasites, less healthy animals, increased runoff. Whereas if you mob your animals up into a single group or smaller groups, so maybe, you know, it doesn't matter how many groups you've got, if they're all moving. Um, I've worked on farms in the past where we've got eight separate groups of animals all on daily rotations. But as long as they're mobbed up, you know, ideally you want to run one or two, but your system might be a little bit too complicated for that. But the idea of mobbing them up, not only are you capturing more energy, because basically all this is capturing energy, but you've also got this recovery as well. And so the idea is that <clears throat> the animals will come into a field, everything will be there for them. You know, it's not about restricting their grazing. It's about allowing them to graze what they need, but you've got to understand how much they need. And then, you know, all these great things happen, but you're, what you're doing by keeping them confined in a group, you're increasing that sort of that competitiveness. So they'll go into a field and they'll be like, oh, crikey, I've got a hundred, of my mates hanging out with me. I'm just going to go straight in and I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to eat because that's essentially what the ruminant was designed to do. You know, it's got a massive belly. It used to hide in the trees, come out, have a feast, go back to and hide in the trees and ruminate. That's, that's the design of a ruminant animal. By allowing them to select the graze, they're just cruising around trying to find bits 
that they like the most. And they will just hit, they will graze it and graze it and graze it and graze it until it disappears. So what you're doing is you're moving them through each day, ideally each day. You know, you can play around. If you're a bit odd like me, you can move them three, four, five, six. You know, I've moved animals on the air every hour throughout the day just to play around to see what, what they would do. And then it's avoiding that sort of that second bite. You know, and it's allowing that plant to perform naturally as it would in nature. You know, so there would have been these great swaths of animals going across rangelands and they would have been chased by a predator <coughs> to keep them moving. And then the only times that they really camped up was in the spring when they were at um, carving or lambing or those sorts of things. And this is where we come to uh, rest and recovery. So your rotation should be designed around plant recovery. It's all about plant recovery. So you want to understand at what stage you think your plant has recovered. You speed up during high growth and you slow down during low growth. So when people say, oh, we're having a long rotation. So during winter, you know, I would have a rotation length of 120 days. So then I plan my grazing around 120 days, understanding that that animal will not return to that place for 120 days. And the spring, when you've got the spring flush, so sort of what didn't really come this year, but usually around that sort of April, April, May time when the grass is absolutely flying and you're getting growth rates over 100 kilos a day, that's when you do your fast, fast growth. And then what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for a dry summer because you're building that biomass and you're building your covers. But you have to understand plant recovery. And that's where that sort of observation and monitoring is key. And you, you look to your animals, you know, you'll know if you've got it wrong because you've chewed your field out or you've left too much. But you, the animals will indicate how quickly or how slowly you should be moving and also the plant as well and be dynamic play around you know sometimes if it gets away on you that's fine you you know you just mob it up and, and get your cattle to or sheep to to work it into the ground and then you're feeding the biology you're not wasting anything you know uh, as my old boss used to say nature doesn't do waste you're feeding something So when to graze, you know, it's, it's based on plant recovery. Try not to graze any more than half the plant. Ideally, you know, you want to be grazing it before it flowers. If the plant starts flowering, it doesn't matter, but you still want it to be green and growing. And this, this is the point at which, this is the perfect point at which to graze because it takes the same amount of time to get to here as it does to get to here to here. So now if you're grazing at this stage, that time frame is the same time frame as from here to here. And that extra added biomass. So this is this is the perfect time. And as your as the plant puts it all its energy into flowering, you're losing the quality of the feed. But if you can maintain the plant at this, it's not stressed. It's got the highest amount of energy. It's got good levels of nutrients, good levels of minerals, and the root structure is staying intact. And so the key is to understand your plants that you're growing and, and at what point visually that is. So you can go around with a measuring stick, you can go around taking photos, but if you record it season on season, you'll get an understanding of where that ideal recovery period is. And it changes with the your diverse nature of your species of your plants. So you you're kind of working as an average. So you again you have to be dynamic. But it's just understanding, okay, it hasn't set seed, but you know, it's looking, it's staying to turn. There's a point at which the stem to leaf ratio changes. And it will just you can just see it. 
it'll grow, 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 and then it'll just stop. And you can see it in your fields, and you know, right, if I leave it another week or so, it's going to go to seed. But if I hit it now, then it's perfect. And don't be afraid if it does go to seed because then you just control your animals to knock that plant down and then you sort of start from scratch again. So this is kind of an example of where I would say it's probably gone a little too far, but the animals are loving it. You know, these are R1 heifers, um, probably May, probably about 300 kilo heifers and that grass is sort of up to their belly and it's green it's photosynthesizing there's very little head on it it's it's starting to flower but there's a lot of goodness in that and you can see in those animals you know they're shiny they're happy that they're, they're doing well and they these guys were growing these guys are growing at one and a half kilos a day these are um kiwi cross jersey frisians um so don't get too caught up if it gets out of control. You can play around with it, but it's just understanding. Speed up during that high growth, slow down during time to low growth, and understanding that individual plant recovery is key. And, and don't be afraid to play about either. You know, don't be afraid to experiment. So here, you know, this is some pig ground that we had. So we've got some rotational um, pigs. And this, this is all fescue, just gone to, gone to crap, really. And so this is a mob of 300 R1 Angus that I, I was running. And to, so to use the animals as tools, so I knew that, okay, that, that, that grass is getting away, no, nothing's going to eat that. But this is where I played around doing that. Uh, moving them every hour on the hour for eight hours and it helped that it was just outside our, our house and so you know you can you can use the animals as tools as well and obviously within reason um but after they had done this you know they, they worked for me i put them out into a field for the evening where they had beautiful lush pastures but it's that impact of that mob that would sort this sort of pasture out. You know, this is almost as tall as me. It's gone out of control. But having that mob density where they will just take the tops off it, probably eat maybe 10, 15%, but they will push the rest down onto the soil and that will break down and feed the soil and put carbon back into the soil and improve your soil structure, improve your soil health and get that function back, functionality back into your field that's been destroyed by pigs basically and that's what it looks like <clears throat> so that's what they're going into that's what 300 animals looks like on uh, 0.1 of a hectare i think it was this is what it looks like after they've finished you know and what i the way that i judged that is i would put them in go and have a cup of tea they would charge in there, they would eat the best bits of the, of the grass. And then once they're full, they'd all sit down and ruminate. And then a few of them would start to stand up again. And they, once they start standing up again, move them again, because they're saying, right, we're done. We've eaten that, we've ruminated, let's go on to the next bit. And if you can look at your animals and understand they're telling you, you know, if you've got animals walking around, they're not happy. If you've got all your animals sitting down in a field ruminating, then, you know, that's perfection. Unless there's no grass in that field and they're all under stress. You can do it with sheep as well, gala. So this is um, up the road at Dan's place. You know, they, we've been running these ro sheep through a rotation. These are this year's lambs. We just killed one the other day. It was... Uh, 50 kilo live weight, 25 kilo carcass, and that was born in when was that born? Sort of March, you know. And this is <clears throat> this is the quality of pasture that they're going into. But they'll go through, and they'll, you know, it's got a weigh on us. Obviously, we're probably too lightly stocked, but the performance that we're getting out of these animals is phenomenal, and we're having no health issues, no worm issues. You know, we give them a 
of a natural garlic drench. Dan's really into his organic system and you know he wouldn't put any chemicals near these animals. And these are all sort of a mix of sort of jacobs and zwart bulls and grey faced dartmoors and you know we've got all sorts in the mix. But these animals are absolutely performing like this one here. This is a little um well it's not little, it's massive. That's its mum. So that's a Jacob U. This is a, a Dorset Jacob cross lamb and it's an absolute monster. And this sort of to me this demonstrates that you know when you get it right it's 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 a beautiful thing. So rotation design. I know with a lot of farm planning um, there's some very complex ways of designing your rotation. When I used to design the rotations, um, I would basically work out, use Farmax, which is like a farm management software in New Zealand, and you'd have all your um, stock numbers, you'd have their weights, you'd have their feed requirements, you'd have historic grass growth rates, you'd have size of fields, you'd have all this information there, yeah, and then you'd, and then I would calculate eight separate rotations based on this information, based on growth rates, based on age, based on breed, or, and it was just super, super, super complex. And then I met uh, Ian Mitchell Innes, and he gave us this ratio. And it, I find it, it, it's really, really, really helpful, and it works. So essentially, you work out the size of the field multiplied by the recovery period, divided by the whole area to be grazed. And you can do this for groups of animals. So say you have a group of animals that are confined to a certain part of the farm, then this is, you know, you can use this ratio really easy. And then, <coughs> So it gets a little bit complex. Well, this isn't the complex one, this is a simple one. So say your field is five acres, okay? If we're thinking sort of late spring, early summer, you sort of, you're slowing down your rotation a little bit. Let's say a 30 day rotation. So five, and this is based on where you feel your plant will have sufficiently recovered for it to be grazed again. And that's going back to that understanding of true recovery period. <clears throat> so then you, you multiply the recovery period by the size of the field, very simple, divided by the overall grazing area. So your grazing platform is 100 acres. Five times 30 divided by 100. One and a half. Hopefully I've got my maths right. One and a half days in the field, okay? Play around with it. Let's break it down into three 12 hour breaks. So break the field up into three, and then there's your rotation. Basic. You know, you go to a different field, it might be six acres. Same thing, same thing. If you're within guide, sort of rough government guidelines on terms of stocking densities, then this works a treat. If you're overstocked, you'll find this a little bit challenging, but you shouldn't be overstocked. So then, this is when it gets a little bit complex. When you then look at it from a more of a science, well, a more of a conventional way of thinking about dry matter intake, stocking densities, everything else, like how I used to um, do my rotations. So say you're running a 100 acre farm, you've got a stocking density of 1.8 livestock units. You are running 90 steers, 400 kilos, or you know, close to 500 years. So essentially, it's about the weight of your animals, which will dictate their intake. So say your mob weight is 36,000 kilos. Okay, I always kind of go for that sort of around because I'm a nice man, I usually overfeed my animals and I usually go for 3% of body weight as an intake. You can drop that down to two and a half. It depends where the animal is in its life, if it's growing, if it's lactating, if it's at maintenance, 
you know, it changes, but around that sort of two and a half to 3% of body weight will grow an animal quite well. Okay, so your, 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 the feed requirement <coughs> of the actual mob works out at a thousand kilos of dry matter per day. And I imagine you all kind of understand that sort of figure, that calculation. As you go into a field, you assess your entry covers. So you look at it and you assess, okay, how much dry matter that is. And it's all, you can do it with a plate meter. You can do it with a sword stick. Um, over time, you can get your eye, you know. And then because you only really want to eat a third, you're removing 800 kilos per hectare. So your exit covers two, two. No. And this is, this is using that ratio. So we can do away with all this information because it works. You know, it, it does work. And that's where you sort of get to that third, 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 third. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter which way you come at it. This, this ratio is, is brilliant. Then we introduce a little bit more complexity into it. So then we add a rating because not every field is the same so we can you know if we've got a newly planted beautiful herb lay that's absolutely on fire and growing at over 100 kilos a day you know that that's a sort of a 95 98 percent rating if we've got an old past you know permanent pasture field that's a bit tired it's been sort of overgrazed not really performing then we change the rating up and you can do this on sort of your grass growth rate. So estimate, just estimate, you know, just a rough guess. And then you can tweak your, your rotation design, the ratio, and make it sort of more specific to each field. And it works. <clears throat> and what you'll find is actually over time, as your um, sort of your feed efficiency improves, you, your area to graze will reduce because you'll have fields that are going out of control because you're not getting to them because you, your farm's performing so well. And that's when you start, you know, you can think about taking that field out of the grazing platform, shutting it up for things like hay or wildflower meadows, or, you know, you can just separate it out of the grazing platform. So then we want to monitor what we're doing, you know, and there's certain ways that you can, you can tell if your animals are performing or not. You can look at their coats. Like these are Wagyu's. These are grass fed, 100% grass fed, grass finished Wagyu's for first light, which sell, um, you know, grass fed Wagyu beef into America. And they are shiny. You know, they, they are absolutely doing well. If you see a ropey wagyu, you'll understand. They're like racehorses. Um, and they're not designed to perform on grass. But these, these, these girls are doing absolutely beautifully. And, and you can see it in, the, in that shiny of the coat. And also looking at the dung. You know, the dung tells a lot. And there's, you know, there's, there's so much out there looking at dung scoring. It's all out there. Um, you just got to Google it. Growth rates when you get it right and because in new zealand like this system is well for me my farming system has to be productive because that's how i get paid so i get paid on live weight gain as a farmer that is what i'm doing i am producing meat to feed to people so growth rates for me are extremely important and that whole conversation around growth rates on the forum today, I know that I can get two kilos out of my cow, out of my heifers, if I get this right. Two kilos a day of live weight gain. And I have never really seen that before in any operation. So it blows, blows your mind. Fertility, you know, look at your cow fertility rates. And another little trick is to get a little piece of litmus paper and put it in a bit of urine and it will show you the pH it will demonstrate whether you're if they're feeding too much energy acidosis or too much protein and that sort of balance should be within that sort of 
six and a half to seven and a half range. You can do your soil health monitoring and um, we're all very aware of the Soil Mentor app and it's brilliant for you know, on-farm monitoring of your own soil. So here you can, you know, you've got your vest scoring, you can look at the, the nature of your soil, you can dig a hole in the ground and assess it. There's so many different metrics that as a farmer, you can test the health of your soil. And you can see it evolve over time. And you'll see whether you're doing damage or whether you're doing improvements. And this whole regenerative thing, it's about repairing damaged land. It's about doing better than you did last year. So this is, a um, slake test, although it's not the um, protocol that they follow for Soil Mentor. But this is a lump of soil that I put out for a demonstration that we had when we had an open farm at Mangarara. And this, <laughs> this was when I was clearing everything up at the end of the day. So this was put in at about, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning, next to a piece of soil that I dug out of the lawn on the lawn of the lodge. The piece of soil on the lodge dissolved in about 10 minutes. And this here held its structure for about three days. I mean, it's ridiculous. And the clarity of that water is phenomenal. And that is the soil structure. That is the, the, the humus that's holding that soil together so that when it pisses with rain, it doesn't flow out your gate, which you see so often over here in the UK. And then here, another really simple monitoring tool, Brex. Now, Brex shows you those complex, the complexity to the, essentially the sugars and the nutrients that are in that plant. You know, so that's demonstrating the photosynthesis effect of the plant. And if you can get, I know Nicole was talking the other day, she was saying, you know, some of the farmers are Brexing above 20. I mean, that is absolutely phenomenal. I know that if you can get your plants brixing above sort of 15, their natural immunity is absolutely phenomenal. And if you can get your animals eating grasses that are brixing above 15, your animal health will be phenomenal. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. It's all about trials, experimentation, monitoring, and learning. So there you go. So please, please, fire away with your questions. Should we put questions in the chat, Tim, or um, speak um, out loud? Just speak out loud, I think it's easiest, yeah. Cool. Great, great chat, really enjoyed that. Um, I've, um, I bought a refractometer a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, I've been taking bricks for the first time, which has been, yeah, super interesting. I've done a bit of following the cattle round when you put them in and you're like, why are they going for that hedgerow over there? And yeah, like bricks is, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's my new favorite toy. Um, yeah. quick, quick one. Cause I'm a, a novice obviously on bricks. So I did second cut silage yesterday, just before the rain. Is brixing about as lucerne and grass mix is brixing at 14 just before I cut it. So mm -hmm. yeah, some was out really happy. Took a brix just before it was baled. So obviously it wilted and it brixed at 25. Wow. So I was like, whoa. And then I'm like, one, is that correct? I was calibrating in between, but my assumption mm -hmm. is it's wilted. It's lost a lot of moisture. So the sugars that will be in it will be concentrated. Would that be yeah. correct? Yeah, or have I just got a completely inaccurate bricks reading? No, I'd imagine it's the um, concentration of of the of the sugars. Yeah. Niels, Niels would you'd be a good one to answer this one. Uh, I guess probably the best thing to do is to take a wet sample and then a dry sample. So you're comparing like for like, that's the only thing I would suggest. But yes, uh, certainly people like Lapo say, for example, yeah, if you're going to take um, cut silage, the like sort of mid afternoon or sort of early afternoon is the optimum period because uh, all healthy plants will translocate each day's photosynthesis, photosynthesized sugars down into the roots, basically. Um, and you may also just pick which field you do. If you're doing multiple fields, those that are bricksing higher would be preferred for hay or silage cutting. Thanks, Thanks
Yeah. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Nice one. Cheers, Humphrey. Can I um can I ask a question about when the grass is getting you know ahead of you? You know, when you feel that um you know you've got too much grass ahead and you're saying to him about um you know getting the cattle onto it but then mm -hmm. by moving the cows so much am i not losing the impact of the cattle on well it, de grass? it depends so that's where you have to understand about the the recovery so because the grass as long as the grass is in a growing phase you know it doesn't really matter because if you're just taking off the tops and it's still growing then mm. it, it will keep growing and you'll just keep building that by you know that 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 base if it's gone too far then you have to pull them back and you have to make that call basically and you'll know when it's gone too far so but and also what you want to do is if you see fields that are getting away and it is during a good growth period then put you know don't just let them go if they get to a point where they've all gone to seed just let them go and you concentrate on holding back that quality on the other on the other fields but if those if you're dealing with permanent so i've got some permanent pasture which is also ridge and furrow some very high ridge and furrow so mm. it's not that you could go and um well it'd be very difficult to make hay on it so say you know, i'm actually in that position right now i've got a field ahead of me 12 acres it looks like it's gone too far to me but it's okay pretty big ridge and furrow and i'm not sure okay, what so, to do well given the nature of the summer now earlier on in the piece i would have said bank it because you might need to come back to it as a little reserve if it got tight mm -hmm. you could use that as as sort of um feed standing hay um, now that it's wet and it's growing again you're going to have another growth period now once we get a bit of heat into this everything's going to take off again so what you can do is really mob up and just hit it hard to knock it down for it to encourage a new growth period basically mm -hmm. so you're getting that quality as long as you've got enough ahead of you elsewhere so that you're not compromising the remainder of the farm you know the worst yep. thing you can do is hit it really hard when you've got nothing else to come back to because there will be a period of maybe four to six weeks where that plant will take to recover and because it's gone so far that recovery period will be a lot longer than if you say just we're taking the tops off. So as long as you understand that, that when you come back to that pit, that, you know, piece of grassland, that it will be a lot later than what's happening on the rest of the farm. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I had a question about, um, cutting for hay um, and you were referring to the, the length at which the animals will graze to that you go over a certain point and it'll cause stress um, would you apply the same sort of uh, rules when you when you come to cut hay to avoid that stress um, I mean cutting hay will definitely stress a plant definitely and you know and that's the thing about cutting hay. I, I tend not to cut hay because you know, I'd rather just bank the feed. Um, but, you know, as long as you're aware that that will cause stress and again, adjust the recovery period accordingly, then that's, that shouldn't be a problem. I mean, you're going to cause plant stress at some point. That's, you know, it, it's fine. It's, it's not a prescribed method. It's just when you're grazing that, it's, quite important to try and avoid deliberately stressing that plant. Cutting hay is fine, but just understand that when you take that hay away, your root structure will be significantly diminished. And so the recovery of that hay field will be a lot slower. Again, same with, you know, trampling it. Only when you trample it, then but by cutting it, that plant is then going to have to drop its root structure to get the energy to then grow again, basically, if that makes sense. And you said that you don't like to cut 
pay? What um, if you're thinking about winter feed? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, because I'm just playing around. Because I've got my my own little projects that I can do now. Um, I would, I would buy in hay over cutting it, um, unless I had a lot of grass. So um, yeah, I think buying in hay. You're basically, and especially if it's really high quality meadow hay, like uh, they're getting at English Farm by the sounds of it, Humphrey. Um, you know, you can buy in some really beautiful, diverse meadow hay, and that will encourage you know a lot of diversity into your fields as well. But you're actually stealing someone else's nutrients. You know, um, what do they say selling hay is like selling soil. But you know, it's it is, and and then it comes down to finances and things like that. Um, but it depends what you're trying to achieve. You know, you might have an excess of potassium in your soils or something like that, and you know, the quickest way to deplete your potassium is to cut for hay. But as long as that hay is going back into the system, those nutrients are staying in the system. It's fine. It's fine. I'm, I just I just like to play around with things and and. You know, I've, I've worked on farms before where we don't really have to cut. And that, you know, that's the beauty of New Zealand or, you know, down here in Cornwall, it's not really cold. Um, so, you know, I'm not really expecting any snow anytime soon. And I'm not definitely not housing my animals. Um, but I'm very privileged to be able to do that. And I totally understand that the rest of the UK might not be able to do that. Um can I ask you a question about improving pasture? Because um, we've got this big bit of permanent pasture that has been historically extremely overgrazed, um, not by us, but by other people. And um, it also had horses on it for a long time. And it's really like, there's maybe like two species of grass. And I've really, I've, the fields that I've semi-mob grazed with the sheep last year have got a lot more white clover in them, but now I'm onto the ones I haven't grazed before. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, like, to get, like, bigger diversity, would you, like, can you hay, like, can you do the rolling out hay for sheep? Does it work if you bale graze sheep? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, I would probably go for small bales. Yeah. Rather than big, so that, you know, you're just throwing out sections. And if you've, you know, if you've got a small farm and you're out there, when I was a kid, that's all we used to do. And we had quite a big farm. So getting small square bales is, is, and then you can sort of sprinkle it out. Um, but also understand that those seeds will be in that seed bank if it is a permanent pasture. Mm -hmm. you know, they, and as the conditions change, different seeds will, will, will come out and you'll see that diversity develop. But it will be a slow process. But yeah, definitely throwing out a bit of hay yeah. for sheep is definitely a good idea. And also that... Um, I was looking at your like the hot the height of the grass thing like I feel yeah. like all our grass went to seed when it was like about this tall <laughs> yeah I mean that's a that's a stress thing and then you'll yeah. see that from overgrazing especially with sheep yeah. because the you know the plant the plant's trying to reproduce basically because it's not happy yeah. um yeah and that's the thing you know in this photo here where I'm standing that's pretty that's been grazed that's <laughs> That was grazed about four weeks before, and that was probably up to my belt, and it was chicory and clovers and all sorts. And then we just, it, it had gone too far. So we just, and this is like where the dairy, we have a small, we had a small mob of dairy cows, maybe 15, that we used to feed the pigs and the chickens. And we just really got them mobbed up up and they just sort of trample put a lot of energy and you can see actually you can see the chicory here starting to recome you know and that's just that, that that to me that grassland is pretty happy but it's that i've seen it before i've gone onto farms where it's just continually heavy grazed with sheep set stocking and the plant just doesn't have the energy and the best way to sort of combat that is just to do successional grazing rotations but only just take the tops off and if you're lucky, the sheep will actually take the heads off the plant. What you want to try and avoid is that selective grazing where they will go in and they will still eat the best 
uh, plants in there, which are diminishing, which is starting to show the head again, and they'll go back to them because they've got the highest mineral content, highest nutritional content. So what you're trying to avoid is you just want them to just go in there and sweep the top off that grass and then come back really, you know, come back, do it again, come back, do it again. And as long as you're not taking any more than sort of half the plant out at any one time, but you really want to try and get that non-selective grazing, especially with sheep, because sheep is um, terrible at selective grazing. Um, can I ask you a question about shade? Yes. Sticky, the sticky shade question. <laughs> sticky shade question, yeah. Um, like, how, ne how necessary do you think shade is? Well, I mean, I think if you get your grass right, obviously ruminants, like I said, you know, they've, they've lived in, a, in the woods, they came out, there was obviously some natural sort of cycle between woodland and grassland and they all, always had that shade to come back to. And that, you know, at Mangarara, we're really keen to do this sort of um, tree planting, infield tree planting, and part of that was for shade. But there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of coolness in the actual grass. So on a hot day, if you lay down in that field, where I am now on that field right there, it's a, probably about 28 degrees. It's Central Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. You know, all those cows in the background, they've just had a group of 20 people um, around them are inquisitive but if they were happy they would just be sitting down in the grass because it's cool in that grass um so whereas if it's a bare heavily grazed you know covers of sort of 1500 then of course the animals are going to be stressed because the, the the soil itself is going to be very very warm and that's another thing with this sort of um longer um more bold biomass is that you're actually shading the soil microbiology as well so you're you know there's less sort of moisture evaporation you're holding more moisture into the soil as well so yes if you can do shade that's great but if you can't you know you can only do what you can do i know um joel sellerton has these crazy shade mobiles that he sort of rolls out into the field and the um, animals all sort of camp under those um, but I'm not really sure of the temperatures. And to be honest, in the UK, you know, is it really <laughs> going to get that hot? <laughs> I don't know. I've worked in Australia. Uh, really. Bloody hot. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen animals out grazing in like 35 degree heat looking pretty happy. So, yeah. yeah. You can see if an animal is under stress, essentially. And if it's, if it's out there and it's panting and it's not happy, then obviously it's under a lot of stress. But, you know. You can only do what you can do. Um, can I ask a question uh, from um, the uh, webinar that Graham Hans did, and there was a bit of talk on the forum afterwards as well about, and then actually one of the pictures you put on about exactly the best point to graze your grass at, because Graham said about having the um, some yellow, you know, litter at the bottom of your your grass, yeah, before you go in to graze, yes. but. I so then I went out into the field and was looking and that where you know I'm in you know in the middle and so like in Warwickshire in the middle of the country and that seemed to me like for my environment a bit far you know going over the peak of of where where you'd want to be grazing and I just wondered what you know a lot of the books that you know, we have access to, there's quite a lot of people in sort of Australia and, diff, and you know, different environments talking about mob grazing. And I just wonder, you know, specifically for the UK, you know, is that yellow leaf a bit far, a bit too far gone? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it could be. A lot of these guys obviously are coming from this brittle environment with a very, yeah. very, very different growing season. And that's where I sort of, you know, I think... It is different. It's definitely different for the UK because it, it is a, a moist, damp climate. You know, it's, it's very, very different. So I probably wouldn't get caught up on that. I would, as long as, because the whole idea around that is to put litter on the on the ground in order to feed that above ground um, biology, basically. So as long as there's, you know, leaf litter going into the system, 
I'm I'm pretty happy. Um, mm. And you know, yeah, people like um, Ian McInnes is the same. You know, he he would say, you know, there's not enough liquor down. Um, but then it's it's a balance as well. You know, so it's it's whatever. You do not want the plant to go too far because you're going to compromise your animal performance and you can tweak it at certain times. So you can put a lot of biomass down at certain times because the whole concept for them is to ensure that you're feeding the biology all the time, but you can feed it at different times of the year. Yeah. And just one more thing that came up from, for me, from what Graham was saying, because he also mentioned about not back fencing quite a lot. Where, where he, you know, he was going into fields and not back fencing, so yeah. there was easier access to water. But yeah. again, on my experience here, yeah. I can't, I can't keep the cattle going forward. You know, they, they yeah. still go back and just yeah. take the, the grass down too, too low. If I'm doing that, yeah. I mean, ideally, what you're trying to do is avoid that second bite. In the UK, if your soils, you know, if your grass is growing really well, and I've seen it. In, in New Zealand as well, in a similar climate, is that your recovery is so quick. You know, I've seen plants start growing after 12 hours, 24 hours mm. ago. So if the plant is recovering that quick, then definitely back fence it. The thing with these guys is they're dealing with these long growing, sort of, you know, very dry periods where you've got one or two growing periods that you really have to hit hard. Whereas in the UK, you've almost got a continual growing season. Like it might sort of slow down in a very, very hot summer um, and also in a very cold winter. But down here in Cornwall, you know, we can, I imagine this place will grow grass all year round. So it's about avoiding that second bite. So if you see your animals going back and grazing, then they are getting that. Because that second, when that plant re-emerges, that is going to be the sweetest, most nutritious piece of grass that they can get their mouths around basically but you're impacting your recovery of your plant so you know if, if it's a if it's a quick growing season definitely keep them moving um but yeah if it's if it's a drought if it's winter if you've got a lot of biomass that you want trampling then let them trample it you know and that might be the case with that field that you're saying that has gone too far because then you're trampling 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 the more trampling you can do on something like that the better but once that grass starts growing again, just try and stop. Because if they nip off that growing point, then you know your your recovery is going to be compromised. Yeah. Thanks. Good. 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 Please don't be afraid to speak up. There's no such thing as stupid questions, only stupid answers. Um, okay. Oh yeah, sorry, you go, you go. Oh no, okay. Um, it was just, uh, you were talking about the, the sheep that you had there, the lovely ginormous sheep. Yes, yeah. Um, and I was wondering what the, what your rotation is with the sheep, like year to year. In terms of parasites well we're sort of i mean we're lucky here because this has been for a long time essentially um and this is part of a greater rotation so this farm does vegetables and, and other things um but there should not be a worm burden in these fields because there is no worm burden you know so these because there's not a historic sheep grazing yeah and, and where they're grazing i mean yeah they're, they're kind of putting their heads down only because this grass has gone too far but we're keeping that rotation so quick that they're only really in there for like a day at most and if you've got your biology if you've got that sort of functionality happening you'll see that that breakdown of dung is super super quick um, it's where you've got um, that biology is struggling and you'll see dung hanging around for, you know, more than a few weeks. Whereas here, your dung sort of breaking down in three days because, I mean, this is an extreme example. 
but this is just demonstrating when you get it right it's absolutely stunning to see um yeah so yeah there, we don't do um fecal egg counts but it would be interesting to see because another thing to think about is worm tolerance and yeah. You know, worms are, are part of a natural system anyway. So mm -hmm. it's about understanding the tolerance level for sheep, not getting too caught up on actual, you know, worm burden, but actually how the animals cope with that burden. And yeah. as the animal health lifts over time, because they're eating grass that's come from healthy soils, it's fixing higher, their immunity levels will be higher, you will get less worm burden as well. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a hard one. Tolerance higher is this, we had a really serious dog attack uh, at the beginning of last year, and the immunity was terrible, actually. That's really interesting. Mm. Very different. Yeah. But it is a, it is yeah, a hard one. I've got to go to my Okay. I'm more person, but thank All you. All right. Cheers, Gala. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Um, so Tim, we've been, um, yeah, it's our first year holistic pan grazing on the farm in particular with the sheep, which we've always, it's a bit more tricky, you know, fencing and escape artists and getting the desired residual, if you want to call it that, and getting a trampoline with the longer grasses. Um, but we've been doing that since lambing and we haven't had, interestingly, I was really worried about foot problems between the claws with the longer lignified grass. Haven't seen any of that at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and in, we've had a really bad parasite burden in the sheep historically and yeah one interest if there's any studies on uh, parasite burdens or reduced parasite burdens in longer grass grazing because already we're starting to see we did a few fecal egg counts last week and they're coming back super low still which is positive but mm -hmm. yeah I, I i'm not aware of any studies as such that have looked at it but um anecdotally we're seeing a positive impact so far and secondly, just in sometimes when it's, you know, it's hard to get the trampling effect when maybe things have gone a bit far or quite lignified or super tall with the sheep. So we're yeah. playing around with a bit of a leader follower system and get the cow, you know, on a two day shift or ideally a day shift and then get the cows in straight after yeah. Um, to, yeah, to get that desired residual. Someone on a webinar recently was saying that actually you shouldn't follow directly behind and you should let it rest and the second rotation come around with the cows. I didn't know if there was, I haven't actually seen the webinar, it's second on info from someone. Yeah, I mean, what you can do, what I've done with lambs in the past, is you just, yeah, you send them ahead. And essentially what they're gonna do is they're gonna pick out the absolute best. Yeah, Cause you're basically allowing them to free choice, to choose what they want and sheep the same. And they will go through and pick out the best bits. And then if they haven't impacted the grass, then it's fine. Then you can really follow through and hit it with a cow. I think waiting for a second rotation is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of pointless because what will happen is you'll lose it. You'll lose the actual quality of, cause you, cause if you're, if the, if the grass has gone like it has here in this image here, obviously it's gone too far, but there's some really good quality in the base. And what we're trying to achieve here, like it's quite a tight group is that they, I should have taken a photo actually, but you can actually see they've, they have trampled it down and created that carpet. Um, but you could easily just let them go ahead and just pick out the best bits, have very, very minimal impact on that grazing and then hit it with your cows. And I, you know, as long as you're still taking no more than half the plant, then that's fine. It's when you sort of take a lot of the plants and then return to quickly, I would say. But yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I've grown out lambs very, very successfully by running them ahead of the cattle and, and they just basically go through and pick out the best bits. But this is, a, this is a poor example of grass, like this has gone far too far. I, I was just putting that picture in there for Gala so she didn't feel bad because I tend to concentrate on cattle. Because the thing with cattle is cattle are designed for this type of system. Sheep are designed for short grass grazing on hills in arid cl climates. They're not, you know, they, 
and that's why you do get foot issues and things like that. Um, but if it's part of your system, it can work. And that leader follower system is really good. And that's where you start to think about like the holistic different livestock classes. So if you've got animals that are growing that you really want to perform, let them go first. So like your growing stock, finishing stock, let them go first, pick out the absolute best bits and then have that trampling effect with animals like cows. I mean, beef cows are phenomenal. They, you know, especially some of the native breeds over here in the UK, they'll look at a blade of grass and get fat. So you've got to understand where, you know, what you're trying to achieve with that animal, basically. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Get some breath. Hi, um, I wonder how you decide on the size of your mobs, sort of the size of your cells. Um, I've been working at sort of trying to get to 100,000 um, kilograms per hectare um, through our herbal lays, which has worked on some points and really well and some regrowth and others not. I just wondered in your sort of the ratio yeah the ratio you brought up yeah, how yeah. you work out your actual sizes within this um i just base it on daily rotations <clears throat> so you can use this this ratio and as long as you're with then sort of Uh, guide like that you know I've, you know it just kind of it's like well there's no point in trying to chase this el these elusive figures you, you just simplify it and if you so as long as the animal is being fed appropriately and that's where i go for that three percent body weight so it's just a simple calculation of your size of your mob multiplied by how heavy they are multiplied by three percent as long as they're getting that, then they are going to perform. And then it's easy. It's an easy calculation because it's basically, you know, you look at your dry matter assessment and then you just break it down and it just turns into a calculation. But I do think that this um, formula devised by um, Mr. McGuinness is, is really, really quite clever. Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, you can get really complex, you know, there's, programs you can get farmax farm iq that you put all these figures into the system and it will give you a size a field size but it, you know it, it's essentially you have a you have an allocated area if it's up to your welly i mean in new zealand we have a lot lower gumboots over there so if it's a red band it's about three thousand kilo to go into a grazing situation you don't really want to eat it down any more than a third, so say you want to take them out at 2,000 kilos, you've got 1,000 kilos of available dry matter in your field per hectare, you know, and then you just work it back. And that, and I think, you know, if you're feeding animals that sort of 3%, it, it changes with dairy. I mean, dairying is a little bit different because it's not necessarily as natural as running sucklers or um, sheep. I don't know if that was helpful or not. No, that is, yeah. I think it's um, it's just a balance between the theory and actually what works on the ground, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you can do the calculation. It is, you know, there's lookup tables. There's, yeah, there's loads of software out there. You can set up a spreadsheet. You, can, you know, I've done that all my, <coughs> a long, long time. You know, I started in the dairy industry. So it was all about that sort of maximizing, um, grassland efficiency in New Zealand and you have these really complex spreadsheets with feed wedges and rotation plans and you know it just gets super complex complex but when we kind of got onto this I was just like well you know I'm running beef cows it's it's fine or yeah. about the quality of the feed that they're getting and understanding at which point they should be feeding on that 
I think is the most important thing. And don't worry about utilization because you're not actually wasting the grass. It's there. It doesn't matter. If you don't take off enough, come back on the next rotation, it's still there. You know, it's not wasted. If you're trampling it down, you're feeding the biology. It's not wasted. There's no, there's no wasted. It, it doesn't matter. It's only when you get to these like um, precision grazing type guys. And I've been there, you know, I did it. I have been there in the past. And you actually understand that it, it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. yeah. So Tim, whilst you're on this equation, um, yeah, if you're if you're trying to use, if you're trying to work back basically, and derive um, grazing periods, how do you, how how would you, where would you get the recovery period from? If that that's a constant in this case, so where where is that derived from? Yeah, I mean the recovery period is based on the recovery period at the time that you do this calculation. So I would I would sort of every month or so, um, depending on. So you, you're looking at the season. So if you've got a period of dry, which we've just had, that is a particular growing season. You know, nothing's really going to change in that season until it rains. So if you're looking at your weather forecast and you can't see rain for the next couple of weeks, stay to that rotation. Stay to that rotation that says it's not going to rain for a long time. So you'd say, okay, I'm going to go to a 100 day rotation because at that point in time, if that stays like that, that's how long it would take that plant to recover. As soon as it rains, you know, boom, it's gonna grow. So then you get a period of a couple of days of solid rain, you know that the weather pattern's changed and you can say, okay, so the goalposts have changed a bit. I'm gonna change my rotation from 100 days to something like 60 days. So then you change it up again and then it, bloody rains for the next two weeks solid and you're like okay bloody hell and then you're starting to get gross like 100 kilos a day because it's dry and then it's wet and then you so then you change your recovery period up to like 30 days and that's and you you have to be dynamic so that this changes constantly and that's the thing the recovery period is not constant it changes day by day and it's understanding that it's changing every single day because it changes with changes with moisture. There's a program that they use in Australia called Maya Grazing, and it's all based around rainfall because that is the thing that dictates growth. You know, because it's not a temperature thing; it's rainfall. In the UK, it's rainfall and temperature. So there's you know there's some gimmies there over winter. Well, it doesn't really matter because most of the animals will be inside anyway. But if you're grazing over winter and it's cold winter, obviously, you know, I used to plan my rotations in Oxfordshire, near you, Humphrey, on a 150-day winter, you know, because to me, it's not going to grow for 150 days. So I base that re recovery period by 150 days. It will grow, but you, you keep it simple. As soon as that sort of spring flush hits, boom. You could be going from a 150 day rotation into a 30 day rotation. It just depends on that moment in time. And you reassess it either month by month or week by week, but you change it as the season changes because it's all about that growth, growth period. Yeah, hi. Um, I've got to apologise for turning up halfway through, so you might already have covered it. Um, but just um, when you're leaving the higher residuals and whatnot, how much of that applies to perennial ryegrass? Because we've, we've got a number of pastures with still quite a dominance of perennial ryegrass, and we find we have to go in quite hard, especially mid-season. Um, and otherwise, you just end up with it going to head. And um, this is grazing dairy cows, so you've just got to maintain the performance a little bit. And would you would you suggest going in a little bit harder mid-season and then pushing the rotation, doing a bit more, take some leave some later on in the season, possibly? Um, I would suggest reseeding your entire farm with a different <laughs> multi-species lay and getting rid of your ryegrass because <laughs> ryegrass does not suit this system. 
It's not designed for this type of system. It's a shallow rooted plant. And unfortunately, if you let it go, it will just turn to seed. And it's, it's just, you know, I was, I was on a dairy farm the other day and they had exactly that same issue. As soon as it turned dry, it just went to seed and it just lost all feed quality. What you can do though is, is you can understand that how that plant functions and lower your, um, lower your residuals, but so that you are only ever taking half the plant. It doesn't matter how big the plant is. You know, you could be working with a plant that's this big. As long as you only graze to there, you're not affecting that plant. And then what will happen is that plant will grow. And then when you come back, you come back to here. And then that plant will grow. And then you come back to here. And then it's the stress. So if, you're, if you hit it too hard, so if you take it back to here and it's stressed, then you're just amplifying that stress. And you're just going to have more issues with heading. But ryegrass is a challenge, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, we do have some good seed stocks of native grasses on the farm. We are seeing them coming in more and more over time. Yeah, um, I'm reluctant to do too much ploughing or overseeding or anything. No, but well. if, it's, if it's ryegrass in a permanent pasture and there's other species in there, what will happen over time is that that ryegrass, if you manage your grassland to a different grass, so say that ryegrass does go to seed, ignore it, you know, yeah. and concentrate on what's there in the base and, and work to that recovery period for that grass that's in the base. And what that will do is encourage more diversity to enter that that because the um the ryegrass will just kind of it'll go to it'll go to seed once it goes to seed it's done its thing it goes dormant you know um so you can encourage more diversity but ryegrass is a challenge because once it goes to seed obviously you've got a greater seed bank and it's more competitive so it is a challenge yeah definitely We've got about 15 minutes if anyone has anything else. I've, I've got a couple of stupid questions. Uh, I, I'm Nat. I've, I've got a, a beef herd on a permanent grassland, but I'm stuck in the Stone Age in my thinking. So what nobody mentions topping. Now, if, you, if I got a field that's been grazed and it's got docks and creeping thistles coming up, nobody's mentioned the word topper. Do you put, keep your topper in the shed and never use it in your system? Pretty or, much, yeah. I, yeah. Well, you know, I've seen docks, docks are an indication weed. You know, basically there's issues with your soil. You've got compaction issues or pugging issues or too many new gin heavy, bacterial dominance. So they're just a symptom. So by topping them, all you're gonna do is encourage docks are insane you know you cut off a piece of dock and it will grow it doesn't matter whether it's the the, the stem or the leaf yeah. or the bloody root yeah. you chop it and it'll just be more docks so you, you know, think so. um by good by good grazing you can actually gradually get the right species mix in and get those symptom species out obviously yeah all right yeah by good grazing but then by addressing other soil health issues. Yeah. Okay. My stupid question number two, I've got some very low phosphate fields. Now, do you go out and buy bags of phosphate or do you rely on great good grazing management just gradually to return the balance in the soil? I would work with my high phosphate fields yeah. and do a nutrient transfer. So play around with the grazing. Uh, as well and also you can take hay from the high phosphate field to feed it out in the low phosphate field okay. basically if you look at your farm as a whole system then you get to understand that you can change but also as your soil health improves access to these minerals will improve as well yeah and yeah. and if you start putting on um, soluble fertilizers again you're just breaking that bond you know and neil's will be hot on this as well because that's yeah that's well actually i'm organic and i do i don't even put on some gap or something you know some yeah kind of, i mean you, you can know. you can put on so if you put on a small amount just to kick things just to get things happening 
Yeah. And then what it does is it encourages the plant to then, you know, sort of get it going, but it doesn't yeah. overwhelm it. It's when you dump fertilizer onto a plant and overwhelm it. But what I used to do in the, in New Zealand is we had like a, um, like a little uh, vortex sprayer type thing for putting on biological amendments. And you can put like a little bit of sort of guano or something like that into that um, mix blend mm -hmm. and um, with other things like um, humates or um, certain soil amendments uh, to get that biology functioning. And then because it's already there, yeah, the plants will absorb it um, easier. And, it, and it's less likely to actually go into the soil, but more likely to go into the plant. Mm. So you can, you can play around, but try not to just go out and chuck fertilizer on there because you, you're kind of defeating the whole purpose of what you're trying to do is create that link between the plant and the soil. And if you, you know, if you're feeding the plant from above, you're basically breaking that link because it's, mm. it's like, well, I'll just get from there. But it would generally be a, a soil health issue. And these things like docs definitely demonstrate that there'll be sort of, you know, some pugging or some sort of compaction issues because they've got a deep tap root. Yeah. Docs are a fantastic plant, you know, they're drawing up minerals. And, um, and when the, the soil is not so high in nitrate, you will see animals eat the leaves. Like we've got the sheep out here have stripped off all the dock leaves because they're high in minerals. So weeds generally have the highest mineral content. I would, yeah, I mean, docs are one of those things that just annoy everyone. Um, there's a, there's things, I, I, I posted this on the forum the other day, but I got shot down. But, you know, there's a guy in New Zealand who harvests docks and thistles and all sorts, and he puts them into a big tank and lets them brew down, and then he sprays that back onto his fields because what that's doing is speeding up the process to transition the field because that plant is trying to do that. You know, it's putting those minerals out there. So you can speed that process up by um, sort of enhancing that. And, you know, that kind of comes from that sort of, I don't know, biodynamic idea or something. Yeah. Some people think it's wacky, but, you know, what you got to lose, as long as you don't have heaps of dock seeds in there and you're spraying out dock seeds. But, if, you know, the dock seeds are going to be there anyway. Yeah. But, yeah, it's generally just a symptom of an issue. Yeah, so... I think I saw it was on an old country high and I country was it called country calendar, oh, country the, calendar yeah, yeah yeah the New Zealand yeah. version of country file which is actually made for farmers not towners yeah. um and uh yeah I think I saw that guy and he was an ex um medical clinician um yeah. and yeah he was doing it and everyone was like oh you're a nutter and then the Maoris came around and they're like oh we used to do that like 100 years ago yeah and he didn't have any docs the next year like like you say the fact is the docs are there to do a job aren't they yeah. and I mean we, we in our herbal lays, I can't get over the chicory roots. You know, I had well, a dig exactly. in the day. They're like 42 inches down. But you know what? A dock root's even better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And <laughs> you, can, you can substitute docks for chicory because chicory is basically a, a, a palatable dock. Yeah, yeah. You know? And as you say, you get it at the right growth stage, super high condensed tannins, aren't they? The sheep love yeah. the docks at yeah, the right exactly. stage. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And I've seen... I've seen that process where one year you'll get a flush of docks, maybe because you um, like pugged it up or something. And then the next year you won't, yeah. and, uh, but they're always there. And also if you can get some grass competitiveness there because docks don't like to be shaded out as well. well while I've got you, Tim, what do you, so yeah, we're organic as you probably know. Like what's your view on like fly control within cattle? So like obviously, I guess there's a bit of a predator prey balance to play with. You know, we've got quite a few rivers going through the farmer. We've got loads of dragonflies, not so much of a problem up in other areas. It is more, a few people have been talking about um, uh, like if flies are attacking the cattle or the animals, it's because they're stressed or there's some people are linking it to like crude protein levels. And yeah, there's, there's all sorts of wacky things, but I mean, I, I'm, I hate putting, you know, um, insecticides on them um is it, what what do you do or what yeah what's your approach on um the i mean yeah we used to get a few of them up at english farm 
Um, I used to put garlic licks out. Um, yeah. But if you're moving your animals, they tend to, you know, they kind of move away from them. The flies are attracted to their shit. So, you know, if, if you can eliminate a lot of shit in the field. Um, and I've heard um, there, are, there are parasitic flies that will eat the other flies as well. Um, and yeah, again, it could be down to that, like you're saying about the stress and the health, and it could be similar thing where like with plants, if there's too much nitrogen in the system and they're stressed, and then they obviously attract a lot of parasites. Um, but yeah, I mean, flies are a bit of an issue in the UK. I, in New Zealand, we're lucky we don't have biting flies. Um, so I hadn't really experienced it until I came to the UK. Um, but yeah, it, it is a tough one, especially with the, um, the eye infections. But I've also heard that that can be down to vitamin A deficiency as well, which is, comes from the greenness of the grass. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Good stuff, thanks. Tim, I don't want that. Oh, go on, Carol. Sorry. Um, I just wondered, Tim, what your idea about using mineral licks is for animals. Like, do you think that's a good idea? Uh, if, if, the minerals, if the minerals aren't there, if they aren't accessing the minerals, it's a good idea. Um, if, I mean... If you can, and I, I, I want to try this um, down here, is the free choice minerals. And because what that demonstrates is that the animals will selectively choose the minerals that they are lacking. Um, some of these mineral licks that have uh, molasses and things like that in them, you know, if an animal is attracted to molasses, it's like putting a panadol and some sugar and giving it to a kid. You know, the kid's going to eat it. But if you do free choice minerals, animals are amazing creatures at figuring out what they need to eat. And that's that whole thing about when they enter a, when they enter a field, like you'll see it, if those animals are missing out on minerals, they'll go and strip your hedgerows, they'll go and strip out, you'll see it, because that's where the minerals are. But what you can do is you can work back and you can understand your soil, what's lacking in your soil by offering free choice minerals, so having, um, available minerals animal available minerals in individualized little sections and they do a lot of this in america and australia and they stay until new zealand and then the animal will choose which mineral it needs um you just gotta be careful with sheep around things like copper which is very toxic um otherwise yeah i mean it is a tough one trying to get a lot of sort of herbage into them offering uh, tree leaves and um, you know branches and things like that um, high mineral plants is a good way of doing it but if you think that there's a mineral and and a good you know obviously blood tests will tell you that plant tissue tests are really good one for looking at minerals because if you do a soil test it doesn't necessarily tell you what the plant's getting you know the plant could be getting especially if it's in a natural system because when they do soil tests um, they're obviously doing plant available uh, minerals, but as you change your management system, you're unlocking different minerals. So a plant tissue test is a really good way of doing that and then working your way back. Have you got any tips for sourcing the free choice minerals in, in this country? Because it doesn't seem very easy to get the individual. Yeah, not yet. Um, I know, well, the, the, the brewers up in Scotland, Andrew, is he doing something with free choice minerals? Maybe um, John Cherry. Um, yeah, I'm sure there, I, I have seen people doing it. There's a, there's a guy down, he's on Instagram. He was one of your students, Niels, and he's playing around with um, free choice minerals for his sheep. So I imagine they are here. Like you, you'd be amazed at what's out there. It's just understanding, and I haven't quite got my head around the type of um, animal available mineral, basically, so they can break that down. Um, so there's a certain form that that mineral has to come in. 
Um, but that information is out there and there's guys in the States that have been doing this for years and years and years. Um, and what it, it, the, the beauty of this is, is that it highlights what's missing from your soil. So you can, so essentially you're adding it to your soil. So instead of putting on a fertilizer, the animal's doing it for you. And then you're getting that animal health through that. Other things that you can feed through your animal are things like humates, potassium humate, which is a, like a, a really good um, uh, soil amendment. Um, you can put through your animals as well. Just to add to that, yeah, we've um, been trying to source free choice minerals for the last couple of months and we think we've got a leg in the door. We're in contact with Andrew Brewster, who's also from the same Brewster, supplier, but yeah, at yeah. the moment it's, uh, yeah, it's not here yet, no, <laughs> but it I is mean... getting really tricky. And I think the more to the point is that now everyone's looking at it, it's going to create a demand. So yeah, yeah, at the moment it has to come from the States, which is expensive and you've got to get it by the tonne. Um, but yeah, if, um, if, if it arrives and it's, uh, the right stuff, I'll put it on the forum, a link, cause it's been really hard to get hold of really yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the thing, you know, once more and more people start using these things, then it will definitely become more available. Someone will see that there's a, you know, business opportunity there and then obviously it will become more available. Can I just go back to the um, the rest periods? Because maybe you said there's no, no such thing as a silly question. But if you're looking at obviously increasing your rest period during um, you know winter, say to you know 100 days plus, yeah, and you've only got a certain amount of available land, and obviously we don't want to be damaging soil structure by overstocking. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. Am I missing something? I can't uh, think. <laughs> well, then your, your farm's overstocked. Right. Basically. Um, but you can also supplementary feed. So you, yeah. can, you can buy in hay and do yeah. bale grazing. And, you know, that's what supplementary feeding's all about. It's about um, making that balance. So you can, and you can bank feed. So you can go into covers like 4,000 plus, you know, bank feed in the, in the autumn. And then supplementary feed with that. Um, winter outwintering in the UK is going to be challenging, but it's going to have to happen because at some point it's going to be unaffordable to house cattle. So I think the sooner that we get onto this, the better. And that understanding around, and then like in New Zealand, I've understood this, and a lot of the dairy farmers over there are now doing really, really diverse multi species cover crops and grazing them for their dairy cows because they're getting an absolute thrashing when they're leaving cows out on brassica fields over winter because we don't house our cattle and they're getting really good gains and that whole bale grazing idea which is kind of stemmed from america although it's designed for a drier situation you can do that here in the uk um, where you have either sacrificial fields which i wouldn't overly advocate but if you want to do any regrassing you can have a slightly sacrificial field you put bales out you know, half of those bales will go into your animals, half of those bales will go into the soil and they will build that soil carbon and they will build diversity. That's one way of getting around it. But yeah, definitely, um, you know, don't be afraid to supplement your feed. Try to avoid leaving the animals in an area for too long and do mm. not set stop during winter because they will destroy your fields. So just talking about having, you know, leaving sort of what you call it banking some some feed for later on yeah. so what that that is so you're literally you know letting it at what point of the year do you start considering putting something aside mm. you know what i mean you can work back if you could do your calculations in terms of your uh, growth rates your grass growth rates so you could look at graphs historic graphs of grass growth rates and you can work back how long it would take you to get to three and a half thousand kilos by the time that grass stopped growing. That would be one way to look at it. Um, it's sort of around September time. Um, if you've got fields that have kind of, um, like through the summer, they've just gone too far and you don't want to cut them for hay, then just close, close the door. Um, we've, I've banked feed that's, and come, come back to it six months later. Um, the problem is, is it, if it goes too far and gets really heavy lignified, um, but it, essentially it's like straw anyway. Um, 
so you know there's no point in feeding straw to a cow and then putting on a like a really lush pasture when you can have lignified grass with a base and there will be lush pasture in the base um but that that's when you get into like your, your really diverse cover crops that sort of you know will maintain their quality throughout the winter and you can get winter growing grasses like timothy's and things like that and even you know, vetch and rise and things like that, that will continue to grow through the winter and offer some quite good quality. And you can balance the really poor quality feed with high quality feed. So you're sort of balancing it out. So maybe spend the morning in one field and the afternoon in another. Um, but yeah, but try to avoid um, overgrazing during winter. And if you, it's better to take a lighter rotation like sometimes you can do two rotations so you take off the tops and then you come back and then you go a little bit further down it's that's far better than going and taking too much off at once because what you're doing is you're sort of balancing that growth so you're not shocking the plant and you know in the uk you will at some point get some form of growth during the winter Okay, thanks. Good, good. Right, uh, a few last questions. It is half past seven and everyone's probably ready for dinner. I'm always. Good. Um, if anyone does have any questions and they don't want to share them on this, then feel free to send me my e send me an email either through my uh, CFLA email or through uh, Tim at the pastoralcollective.com. Um, and yeah, I've got a website, but it's not a very good one. Uh, TimWilliams.farm. And I'm more than happy to, um, especially if you're in the southwest, come and visit you and have a chat. Hopefully, Humphrey, I'll get up to see you soon. I was actually in your neck of the woods the other day. I went to Wardington Estate and met up with the land gardeners. So I've got some really exciting ideas around compost and uh, compost teas. And yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you. And I was also talking to Abby as well around the work with FAI. Yeah, nice. Sounds good. And so, yeah. So, Always uh, keen to talk compost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got some really good ideas around compost, compost teas. I really want to try some, some stuff as well. So hope to get up to see you soon. But yeah, feel free to drop me, drop me a question online. And yeah, James, I hope I'll see you down in Cornwall as well at some point. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Oh, nice one. Cheers, Tim. Thanks, buddy. Okay. Thank you thanks very much. much. Brilliant. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks. thanks a lot. Bye.